Review series, and today we got a special treat for you, something we've been wanting to tackle for quite some time. I am of course talking about Universal's first attempt to remake Kong back in 1975, this of course being the rival to Dino De Laurentiis' production, simply known as The Legend of King Kong. The story, written by One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest writer Bo Goldman, takes place in the Great Depression of the 1930s. Carl Denham, played by the rumored Peter Falk, is a big-time showman, filmmaker, and adventurer, and heads out to fund an expedition to find the greatest show in the world. But many say to Denham that the only thing nowadays that will make a good show is a bright female star. Looking through the city, he comes across an out-of-work girl named Anne Darrow, played by the rumored Susan Blakely, and offers her the adventure of a lifetime. Anne agrees, and they set sail on board the tramp steamer known as the Panama Queen, commanded by Captain Inglehorn and his first mate Jack Driscoll, played by the rumored Robert Redford. During the voyage, Carl hears of a legendary god known as Kong, for which they set sail to the island that might house the legend, while Anne and Jack strike up a relationship. As they anchor on the shores of Skull Island, the crew comes across a group of primitive natives, which dwell in the prehistoric village guarded by a stone mountain-like wall. The natives then kidnap Anne and offer her to the ancient god known as Kong, who carries Anne off into the jungle. Denim, Jack, and the crew venture into the deadly forest to rescue her, encountering a variety of prehistoric creatures. But after Jack saves Anne from the vicious beast, Kong is captured and brought to New York, but suddenly escapes to wreak havoc upon the streets of Manhattan, before meeting his demise atop the Empire State Building. Okay, so a lot of the plot is similar to the original film, but honestly, that's what Universal wanted since their idea of a Kong remake came to mind. And let me tell you, there's a lot of back history on this one. You see, back in the early 70s, Kong's popularity was at an all-time high, given the censored shots that were long since forgotten were restored into the film for a popular release, which introduced the original film to a new generation and brought the character back to popularity again. And while fans love the original and despise the two Toho films on how Kong was portrayed, many considered for Hollywood to remake the classic in widescreen, color, and a pretty big budget. And a lot of the proposal for a remake came from not the producer of Paramount, nor Universal, hell, not even Dino De Laurentiis, but a producer at ABC named Michael Eisner, who would later be the head of the Walt Disney Company. Hmm, can you imagine a remake of Kong done by Disney? Hell, maybe even animated! King Kong! A truly epic film. It's got laughter. It's got tears. Mystery. I changed my mind! I changed my mind! I don't even want to think about that shit! But it turns out, Eisner had saw the original Kong on TV and thought, given its popularity, a remake was a perfect opportunity to bring the ape to life for a new generation of moviegoers. Excited, he went to many of the major studios to pitch the idea two of which seemed very interested. His first meeting went to his friend Barry Diller, the head of Paramount Studios. Then he pitched the project to Sid Sheinberg, the head of Universal Pictures. As both studios had time to think at different appointments, the studios went to RKO to see if the rights for the film were available. While Universal had a verbal deal with RKO for the rights, it was Paramount who had a signed contract with the studio and started working with Dino De Laurentiis to produce the project right after. Still thinking their deal was settled, Universal started advertising public announcements for their remake. What followed was one of the most heated court battles in Hollywood history. Each studio was suing each other for damages, unfair competition, and arguments on who really had the go-ahead to produce a remake of Kong by RKO. It seems both Paramount and Universal were in civil war of such and divided from each other to focus their attention on each other's remakes. While Dino De Laurentiis seemed in the right to focus on his version, Universal was in a bit of a pickle. They had the verbal deal, but Paramount had the dried ink on the contracts. And you can read it for yourself in this photostatic copy. I, the undersigned, shall forfeit all rights, privileges, and licenses herein and herein contained, etc., etc. Facts, memo, bis, punitor delicatum. It's all there, black and white, clear as crystal. Not wanting to lose the battle, they came to an interesting discovery. 
When the original Kong had its share of merchandising during its original run, a novelization of Marion C. Cooper and Edgar Wallace's story was written and published by Dellis W. Lovelace, which is still being published today. But in the early 70s, after Cooper died in 1973, who of which Robert Armstrong also passed the exact same day, interesting twist of fate, Cooper failed to re-sign the book's copyright before his passing, which meant the novelization of King Kong fell into the public domain, meaning everyone and anyone could technically sell and adapt the book. Huh, talk about fair use. Oh come on, give me that one guys, seriously, how hard is it to make a joke like that? <laughs> so in a logical way, while Paramount had the movie remake rights, Universal could go ahead with its version by adapting the novel into a film, rather than basing it on the original film, which was still under copyright by RKO. But to avoid any similarities to the original 1933 film, Universal had to make several changes in the story, one of which was the character of Carl Denham. In the original, Denham was all about the adventure and wanting to make his movie, but while being sort of a mad genius, he did care for his friends and ultimately Kong by the end of the story. The Denim in this version, however, was a selfish, determined villain by all accounts. He clearly only cared for the perfection of the movie he was making and the money that would be made on Kong's success in New York. And given his villainous ways, he does get some good comeuppance. In the Empire State Building battle, Denim was to jump in one of the planes filming the dramatic climax. But when trying to get the pilots to fly in for a perfect shot, Kong smashes the plane and Denim falls to his death as he films his demise. Other characters like Anne are changed as well. In this version, she's very much like Jack in the Paramount film, not wanting to partake in Denim's show and trying to save the great ape from being killed. And while the venture was renamed the Panama Queen and the Skull Island walls design was much more different than the original, the dinosaurs were a massive change. Many of them changed from scene to scene. The Stegosaurus was going to be replaced by a Bellogitherium, which is a prehistoric rhinoceros, and the Swamp Scene's infamous Brontosaurus was originally going to be a giant prehistoric amphibian, but would later be replaced by a Parasaurolophus, which I gotta admit is a cool idea. The Tyrannosaurus Rex battle was another huge debate for the studio. They really wanted to use a T-Rex-esque creature, but they were scared it would infringe on the original. While surviving storyboards and some concept art predict the Rex for the scene, the studio did come up with a pretty good replacement of a Triceratops, which when you think about it, brings back the classic scene that was deleted from the original. The serpent-like Elasmosaurus that battles Kong in his lair was a vote between a giant eel lizard of sorts or a giant centipede. That alone is a cool idea as well. Hell, there were even talks about putting the missing spider pit scene with some giant scorpions. And finally, the Pteranodon that attacks Fay Ray in the original was to be replaced by a prehistoric vulture of sorts. With all these spectacular new recreational scenes, along with a bit at the wall where Kong burns down the native village, how the hell was Universal gonna pull all this off? Well, thankfully, one man came in to lend a hand with the studio. That, of course, was stop-motion animator Jim Danforth. He pitched to the studio that doing stop-motion animation with the new and improved camera technology of the time would have wowed audiences and made for a spectacular movie. Universal liked Jim's ideas and set him to work on several conceptual art and designs for the project. Like I said before, there were several casting rumors at the time while Universal was in pre-production. While Peter Falk was the perfect choice for Denim, there were other suggestions for Jack and Anne aside from Robert Redford and Susan Blakely. Stars like Nick Nolte, Cher, and Farrah Fawcett were also considered for the roles. I can make you a nice cup of tea. How about some fresh fruit juice? I don't know how to make chicken soup. Hell, even Meryl Streep offered to take the role after getting a rude response from Dino De Laurentiis in an audition for his remake. That was uh, Dino De Laurentiis Sr. And his son um, had seen me in a play. I walked in and, and his son was sitting there very excited that he'd brought in this new actress. And the father said to his son, in Italian, because I understand Italian, he said, Che brutta. You know, why do you bring me this ugly thing? Whoa. Yeah. Ouch. There were even talks of George C. Scott and Richard Harris as Captain Inglehorn, and the studio even wanted Faye Ray to make a cameo in the film. The studio chose Joseph Sargent to direct the picture, and I gotta be honest, I think he would have been great, given he had some pretty good successful films beforehand. Well, afterwards... 
yeah, not so much. Speaking of which, it was pretty obvious at the time with the success of Jaws, Universal wanted to make more monster movies to continue the studio's success, and Kong for them seemed like the perfect opportunity. But unfortunately, many more problems were heading their way. While the courts were still in a heated debate, Jim Danforth's ideas seemed to be getting a little hectic, and most of all expensive, which is what Universal really didn't need. So instead, they decided to go with a simpler approach for the effects with men in monster suits. Even though Jim was upset with the changes, he decided to stay on board as an effects advisor. The visual effects reins were handed over to Chris Mueller Jr., a veteran of Universal's Golden Age, for his work was in making monsters for films such as The Deadly Mantis, The Land Unknown, and most notably, The Creature from the Black Lagoon. His job was to create the miniatures and monster suits for Kong and his dino companions. For Kong, he suggested using facial appliances to create the expressions on the beast's face, very similar to the Planet of the Apes films. Film collector and ape suit master Bob Burns came to do a screen test with the Kong suit prototype. While it did look good for the most part, there were still some problems to fix, and as pre-production went on, the studio was swaying further away from the look of the original, to the point where they considered redesigning Kong as a human-ape hybrid. Wait, what?! It was even apparent that money was so low they considered reusing Max Steiner's score from the original. But with all that was planned, the studio didn't get much further than it wanted to. In November 1975, RKO, Paramount, and Dino De Laurentiis were all allied in a counter-lawsuit against Universal, and the studio was pretty much outnumbered. Not wanting to lose millions of dollars over a film that was having several problems, they decided to settle terms and surrendered. However, the only one who wanted to see them fail completely was Dino De Laurentiis. Before surrendering, Universal offered a truce with the producer by joining forces and creating a single, bigger picture. But Universal wanted to use their script. Dino was furious and instantly rejected the deal, immediately filling out a massive lawsuit of his own against Universal for damages and competition. However, Paramount was not pleased with Dino either. Universal and Paramount are good friends in the sharing business when it comes to distributing movies, and Paramount strictly told Dino that if he went ahead with his lawsuit, the studio would back out from his Kong remake. With no choice, Dino agreed to settle. The deal ultimately came to Universal having the merchandising rights, while Paramount had the movie rights. And only after 24 months post the movie's release, could Universal then obtain the movie rights and go ahead with its still-wanted remake. Which we'll talk about sometime down the road. Universal may have lost the battle, but the war for their proposed remake would rage on. You lose! Good day, sir! To sum up the mess that was The Legend of King Kong, I think it would have been cool to see, honestly. I mean, it's pretty obvious with history that the world would not support two Kong movies at the same time. And you can kind of see how confusing it would have been, given that some other studios that had two different versions of a story told in today's world. But regardless, I think it would have been a fun and entertaining retelling of the classic story. The cast would have been fantastic, and the effects could have been a great sight as well. While the movie was never made, it is a great what-if story, and is by far one of the most interesting stories in the history of Kong. I'd give it overall an 8 out of 10. <laughs> However, the story is not over yet. There's still much more to tell on Universal's Kong, so tune in next time when we jump to the 80s and early 90s and take a look at another director's attempt to tell the classic story. And we'll give you a hint who it is. The film could have been great, or it could have been a schlock.